Are we ready to start? Uh, good? All right. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming because there is four sessions, as far as you remember, in the same row. So it's important to, for me to, to see lots of people here. So thank you a lot. And uh, welcome, first of all. And today we are going to talk about multiplayer Pac-Man with our socket. And during this talk, I'm going to explain why our socket is the best solution, why it's a future protocol and why you have to start using and at least start looking into this solution. All right. First of all, to save your time, to make it possible to switch another session quickly, if, it's not, if it doesn't fit you, I'm going to quickly say for whom this talk. First of all, this talk is for all network application developers. So if you're doing microservices, if you're doing distributed system, if you're just doing client-server communication over the browser or from your Android or iOS application to a server, it fits you because we are going to talk about network protocol and why it's solved and why it's better than others. Then if you care about performance, it also will really fit you because this protocol and this talk is about performance and performance benefit use in particular solution. And this talk is for all reactive adopters. How many of you are using reactive programming, using Rx Java 2 or Project Reactor or heard about those technologies? Okay, just a few hands. Great. So I hope after this talk you will start looking at this solution because, yeah, this protocol is about reactive programming. So, are you stay with me? Okay, let's start. So, quickly about me. My name is Oleg. I'm from Kiev, from Ukraine. Uh, I work for Netify. Basically, at this company, we are building our socket as a protocol uh, and as an implementation, in particular, in few languages. Also, I love reactive programming and believe that this is uh, the future of uh, development. And I'm one of the contributors to Project Reactor. That's why I like talking about reactive things. All right, our today, today's agenda. So what we are going to do, first of all, we are going to define the problem, what kind of solution we are going to build, what in particular, in particular we have already has in our solution. So today we are going to, to look at the Pac-Man game. We are not going to look into the, into the details of implementation in the business logic, but we are going to look at the protocols, at the solution for doing communication between client and server and so forth and so on. So you should expect that. Then we are going to compare protocols in order to choose the best one. Then during this competition and this comparison, I, will, would, I would like to, I would ask you to uh, join this comparison. We are going to have some fun by playing Pac-Man game, real multiplayer online Pac-Man game with different solutions. And you will go in to assess which, which one is the best one. And finally, we will define what is the best solution for building real-time, high-performance networking application? Does it make sense? Great. Let's start. Let's start with discussion about multiplayer requirements or what, do we, what, what we want to achieve by multiplayer Pac-Man. First of all, since we are going to build a multiplayer game and multiplayer game means multiple devices, the simplest way to involve everyone is to provide some browser game, right? So we are going to build browser client implementation, and since we have client, we have to have server to which we are going to make a call, and the server at the first as the first response will return, for example, index.html page, which is which will be just empty page with some definition of scripts. Then what we expect from the server, we expect some modern. Um, more advantage technology or techniques in order to send data. So we expect some server-side push in order to push all requirement, required information like tiles, information about the map, etc., and so forth and so on. Then, as the next step in communication in our game, we expect that someone connect to, to the game by calling, OK, this is my name, so please register me in the game. And the game will return the first state or information about other players connected to the map. Then, in order to make this game all kind of in more interactive, we have to send some information. For example, we can send on every step information about our location. So this is the simplest solution. So we we will be streaming location uh, of, of our player in on our map. In order to get updates from other players, we have to listen, for example, to stream of other players. So we will connect to kind of to the server and we'll be listening to the stream of other players' movement. So this is the simplest solution uh, in order to make this game interactive. Finally, 
this game has to have some competition, has to have some competition. So every player will have some score, we will have some scoreboard, so Pac-Man would be required to, to eat some food on the map, and of course Ghost would have to, to eat other Pac-Mans. So this, there, will be, there will be some challenge in which you will be involved during the gameplay. All right, so far this is just a plain client server communication, nothing should be complex, but today we are living in the real microservices world, right? How many of you are building enterprise solution today? Okay, few hands. What else? Who, what, what you're, what, who else, what, uh, what, what the rest of the audience are doing today? I'm just curious. Client server communication, monolith, no? Yeah, all right. So let's name it monolith distributed systems. So we have to have some piece of real enterprise. And yeah, this talk is about real enterprise solution and microservices solution. So we are going to introduce some part of real enterprise to our system and make a di real distributed system. So we are going to collect some information about uh, or collect some statistic about every player movement. So we are going to put some Kafka in between in order to just push all information, all movement from every player. And then in order to make uh, some kind of business processing, since the Kafka is elastic storage, and it can just collect all the data without any problem. So we assume this is a really elastic and scalable solution. Then we are going to put some data pipeline, which will be consuming data from the Kafka in order to process them, in order to aggregate them, and then to send to some machine learning algorithm, which will try to teach some both in order to make them smarter. So we will have this kind of uh, enterprise pipeline, which could work really fast, or in some cases it could work really slow, because who knows how, what, what is the state with our microservices and real hardware. So we should expect that nothing is stable. We have to assume that everything can crash, and we have to preserve the stability of this pipeline. So to, sum, to summarize, what we have seen. First of all, from the communication perspective, we have plain server side push, right? When we have to push some uh, tiles information. Then we have plain request response, that's what we are doing every day, the most common communication between client and server uh, in this game. And then we have some client side streaming when we have to send location updates on every step. And then we have to listen to the same stream of data from other players on different machines. Finally, we have some machine learning pipeline which can work slow or fast. We don't know at which point it starts being really slow or at which point in time it will be really fast. So we have to provide the stability of this pipeline in order to make, because it's really important to collect all information about all players without crashing and uh, kind of uh, losing the stability of the system. So a little bit about the toolkit. What we are going to, what we have already started using here. First of all, on the backend side, we are using Spring Framework. Any Spring Framework users here? Oh, great. Amazing. I love you. Spring Framework is amazing technology. So then we are going to use Project Reactor because Project Reactor is the, the best way to build understandable pipeline of data processing and make your system really fast without blocking any threat. So non-blocking, really fast data processing. This is about Project Reactor. Then we are going to use protobuf. How many of you, oops, not like this. Have you ever heard about protobuf before? Okay, for those who haven't heard about protobuf before, protobuf, come on, I switched again. Protobuf is a message format. It's a binary message format designed for small message size because plain JSON is text uh, version of a message format so it can uh, be kind of more, much more um, huger in size. So we, since we are going to build really high performance and real-time solution, we have to care about the size of the message and make uh, all the data that we are sending really small. That's about pr protocol buffer. Um, yeah, this project is from Google. On the front-end size, just for your information, we are using Phaser Framework. It's just a framework for building this UI and uh, game, uh, game play on, in the browser. Then we are using Reactor JS for the same reason, for performance and uh, cleanness of your transformations and data processing. And we are using TypeScript because I don't like JavaScript. It's dynamic language. I'm Java developer. I love static typing. That's why TypeScript. 
I guess it's clear. And finally, we are using for the balance on the front and on the, on, on, on the back end the same protocol buffer in order to make everything fast. Is it clear? Any questions so far? Great. So let's take a look quickly at our project. This is really plain project. Nothing complex there. A few modules here. We have game client, which is basically a TypeScript code. Some types, some definition of API, uh, business logic, etc. We have Spring application, which is game server. So nothing complex, just a few dependencies on our socket, web flags, etc. Like I put everything here in one application, and we have some plain. Uh, come on, it wasn't indexed. We have plain Spring Boot application. Do you see it? Yeah, now it's better. We have Spring Boot application, plain annotation. I guess everyone were aware uh, has has um, has already seen something or already done something before. All right, that's really plain project. Nothing complex in there. So let's go further and talk a little bit about protocols. So what kind of protocols can we use in, in order to build our system? Any idea? What protocols do you know? Yeah. The first, the simplest solution would be to try, maybe implement it in the HTTP. And I'm saying HTTP 1 because most of the browser still works over HTTP 1. And we, like, in the most cases, it's sometimes really challenging to implement it, uh, to work it properly over HTTP 2, because there is, there is a few options to make it work with HTTP 2. So we are talking about HTTP 1. What else? WebSocket, yeah, but maybe more advanced solution in order to build kind of, since we have not only browser to server, but yeah, WebSocket is a correct uh, answer. We, ha we can use TCP, for example, right? In order to make fast communication between our, in, in our pipeline, right? What else? UDP, but it doesn't work in browser, so yeah. Of course, we can use HTTP too, because we have the same, our machine learning pipeline. We can use something else like UDP, but we want to have some reliable solution, so it's, it would be really challenging to, to provide proper data sending over UDP, for example, in our pipeline. And it was a correct answer that TCP doesn't work between uh, client, for example, between browser and server, so we have to, have to replace TCP with almost equivalent, equivalent WebSocket, right? So this is basically the set of protocols that we can use in order to build our solution. All right, how to compare them? Any idea? OK, I'll try to share um, what, what would I use in order to compare all these protocols. First of all, I would take a look at the maintainability. Why maintainability? Maintainability means that I can Google for a particular solution and find an answer. Find an answer in Stack Overflow, and I can solve my bug, my problem, my whatever issue. Does it make sense? It should be solvable. It should be Googleable. We have to have support from, from many fr frameworks from any language, and we have to have some community which has already adopted particular particular protocol. That's about maintainability. Then the protocol should provide as much or as many uh, as much stability as is possible from just protocol definition and from framework definition. So our solution should provide the highest possible stability, and our application should just work without any problem. And finally, what is the most important for us is performance. Since we are building a real-time game, it's important to provide the lowest latency, the high throughput, so we have to, to, to take a look at the performance. Does it make sense? Great. So let's try to compare, and let's just start to take a look at old HTTP, which is HTTP 1.1. One. And I'm not going to, to, to do something with HTTP 1, because it's kind of obvious that HTTP good because it's plain, simple, it's supported for many years, it's used by many companies, and most of the today's solution is built on top of HTTP. However, why, uh, yeah, we can, for example, take a look at this snippet, uh, which is part of Sprint Framework, so we can easily define any HTTP API just by saying that this guy is our controller, just a few annotations, for example, post mapping, then we, have, we can process today's Everything this, for example, project reactor and functional reactive programming, and everything is pretty good and clear, right? So development experience is also really good. However, 
Why not HTTP? First of all, HTTP is text-based protocol, so we don't have any other option than sending everything in text format, which is overhead. That's obvious. In turn, for HTTP 1.1, there is some inefficient resource usage, which, ha which means that we sometime, from time to time, from browser to browser, we open a few more connections that, it's that it requires, requires and this, that it expects. Uh, it's expected, right? So you open, in, for example, in Chrome, four connections. In Safari, it could be eight connections. And our browser have to handle much more uh, kind of connections that, that it's needed for data sending from one client to one server, right? This leads to slower performance because we have to send everything in text format over a few connections, handshake, etc. And f in addition, we have some communication rigidity. Even so, we have HTTP 2 today. From the browser perspective, nothing ch has changed. We have the same simple request response. We, some, we have some hacky uh, server-side streaming over a server sent event. Have you ever heard about server sent event before? Just a few hands, right. Just nobody heard about that, so it's less useful, uh, usable today. And this is another problem. So we have only, just in simple, uh, in simple words, just plain request response, and that's not good. We have to solve many other problems, and it's hardly possible to solve them with, uh, with plain request response. And finally, HTTP doesn't have proper resilience. What does it mean? First of all, if you're going to look at the flow control with HTTP, we will see that. This is, on the right, it's, it's our server. On the left, this is client. And client just sends, sends, sends some data until our server die from this stream, right? We don't have any, any other option to control. And in order to make our server and client stable, we have to implement lots of things. We have to solve challenge with retry logic. We have to uh, handle timeouts because requests could, could last too long. We have to provide then circuit breaker in order to open circuit breaker and then handle some default in case our server dies. So we have to solve lots and lots of lots of problem, which maybe we don't have to solve today, right? This is really challenging for us. So it's clear that we need back pressure. Have you ever heard about back pressure before? Okay, just a few hands. So in order to explain you uh, what back pressure is, I need a volunteer, Fiona. Can you help me? So I'll try to show you why back pressure is important in really simple interaction between two persons. So the game is really simple. Just imagine that I'm server, right? Fiona is a client, which sends me, da uh, sends me data as fast as possible, right? So she will be throwing balls into me, and I, my, uh, my, kind of my responsibility to handle everything. But I have only two hands. This is my capacity. I know the capacity of my server, but client doesn't know anything about that. So client, the, uh, the task of the client to throw bolts as fast as possible, my task is to handle everything. So I, when I say I'm ready, Fiona should start throwing bolts into me. So let's see, I'm ready. Ah, that's what happened. And that's basically what happens when, you st when your client just starts sending data as fast as possible without checking whether server is ready or not because there is no such mechanism, right? There is only way to just send, send, send data until we got some exception. This is the only option. Now, just imagine that in addition to our plain I'm ready communication, I would add some additional flow control, like I would say how many elements I, I'm ready to handle. Since I know that I have only two hand, I can say, okay, please Fiona, I'm ready to handle, but I'm ready, I'm requesting you to give me only two balls because I have two hands. Please send me with the same speed. And here we go. I put some in the ball in my pocket, and then I'm ready to handle another two, or three, or four, because I now, now I know the speed of processing all the messages. And now I can send this particular frequency for the next portion of balls. Thank you. So is it clear right now how back pressure works? and why it's, required, uh, why it's really important to implement it. Yeah? Is it clear? So, one of the ways to, to handle back pressure, to handle flow control, co control proposed by a reactive stream specification is by saying how many elements the, the subscriber is ready to, to consume at this point in time. So the producer will asynchronously send the stream of these elements until the next request. request. So this is really simple. 
All right, it's clear that HTTP 1 doesn't fit in, into our needs. It's slow and it doesn't have proper resilience and stability. So we have to take a look at other solution. What's left? We have WebSocket and HTTP 2. So let's take a look at the WebSocket. Why WebSocket? WebSocket is almost the same TCP with no overhead, just a few headers for frame lengths and this, that's it. Almost the same TCP, which means WebSocket is about high performance because there is no overhead, only one connection. Bidirectional, we can send data back and forth in the binary format. Cool. Why not WebSocket? From my experience, this is really complex challenge to implement proper server, WebSocket server on top of, for example, on top of pure WebSocket. For example, if you're going to take a look at Spring Web Flux, and if you try to implement WebSocket on top of Spring Web Flux using reactive data processing, you will end up with really complex solution. And yeah, from my experience, this is not the best uh, choice to, to start doing uh, kind of WebSocket server on top of pure WebSocket. And what you will see at the end, if you start doing that, you will implement or reinvent your own application protocol with routing, with message format, with headers, with metadata, and whatever you would need in your application. That was from my experience. I did that once, and I don't want to repeat that again. So, of course, there is existing solution today, and you would agree with that, that there is SOX.js and Stomp, Stomp, which allows you to implement some messaging on top of WebSocket, bidirectional messaging. There is socket I, which is super popular in JavaScript. So maybe let's try to, to take a look at those solution and take, for example, socket I in order to implement our communication between client and server, right? So let's try to do that in, with socket IO. And now, just suppose that we have already done that. Let's try to assess whether this solution is good, high performance, stable or not. So now I'm welcoming you to scan this link or input this, uh, this link into your browser and join the Pacman competition, and in this way we will figure out whether the application is stable or not. The link is really simple. isgd slash socket IO. The, the first part will be the same all the time. The only thing that will be changed is the 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 hash after, after the slash. So the, the first time it will be socket I, then we will see what will be the next. So let's go to the game. Let's open it. Let me log in. And here we go. Now I'm playing. So let me try to find someone. Where is everyone? Come on, I'm ghost. I want to eat someone. Hello, everyone. So is it working in general? Is it lags or not? Does it, does it lag you or not? Oh, yes, it's laggy. Do you see that? Oh, no. Why everyone stays on the same place? That's something weird. And I'm pretty sure I done everything correctly. Like the business logic is implemented purely, clearly, and I tested it, so the only reason could be the socket IO. So it's clear that it's laggy, yeah. From nowhere, the Pac-Man appeared on my map. Okay, let's go back to, to the slides, and let's take a look uh, on what's going on under the hood. Maybe the, the implementation in the ser Java server socket IO is the reason of that lagging. So if you're going to, to look at the development experience, and if you, you will try to implement something on, uh, in Java for socket IO, we will see that there is no integration with Spring. For example, for me it's important because I'm Spring fan, so I'm building every application using Spring, and I expect that there is proper integration with Spring. In order to integrate socket IO with Spring, I have to write this stuff. I have to create server myself, have to start it, and then I have to integrate it with application lifecycle in order to shut down it right after my application, for example, stops. If I don't do that, the application will still work in on the same socket, and this will be a problem. What else? In general, there is a feeling, for, at least for me, like that socket IO for Java was just copy-pasted from JavaScript. And if you're going to look at this definition, you will see the only callbacks. 
and that's all you have to do with socket IO. And this is something we don't uh, got used to in, 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 for example, in Java world. This is a problem, another problem. Finally, why I chosen this socket IO implementation for Java? I like I chosen particular Java library, which is built on top of Netty. How how many of you heard about Netty? Okay, for those who haven't heard, Netty is high performance um, web framework. Let's call it web framework, which allows you to manipulate all the data without bringing in it into heap. Which means that you will get high performance because you get less GC. You you don't have to copy data which. Uh, get to, to your network card, you can directly access to them and manage everything without copying into, into, into your heap. And this is amazing part of the net, uh, along with the fact that this is non-blocking solution. So if you're going to look at the data processing, we will see that the only way to get to the bytes in the binary format, because I have to convert then this binary data to my protobuf representation. So the only way to get this data from the server is to say that I want to get byte array. And no, no, there is no other ways. So I have to copy everything from direct memory to heap. So which means that I have to produce more object, I have to allocate more heap uh, in my Java memory, and I have to allocate another object from Protobuf. And this is basically hits the performance. This is the main problem in socket IO. So it, it's worth to say that this is basically a good solution, but not in Java. If you're a JavaScript developer, then the socket IO is pretty good solution and stable solution, and it really works pretty fast and well in JavaScript. But not in the Java world, since we, I am Java developer, I need to more reliable solution. All right, what else? What else do we have? So how many, we, we, basically there is only HTTP2, so we have to choose something on top of HTTP2. Have you ever heard about anything built on top of HTTP2? Any framework? Fast, stable, reliable, with flow control, back pressure support. Yeah, I heard about gRPC as way, as well. So let's try to implement our solution on top of gRPC, since this is a good framework from Google. Why not? Let's try. Just imagine that we implemented that, and let's just to try and check whether it's better than socket I or not. The link almost the same. The only difference is reactive gRPC right now. So let me just copy the link. It's really simple. And open new version of my game. This is gRPC version. Let's put my name. And here we go. Yeah, it works better. At least someone moves. Yeah, reminder, the ghost should cage the Pac-Man, not other way around. So I have to collect food, and ghost have to collect Pac-Mans. This is the idea of Pacman. And yeah, in general, it works better. A little bit of lux. Do you see the same lux as I, as I do? Yeah, the Pacman, the ghost escaped. Yeah, I'm the best gamer. So it, it's clear that it works better, but with a little bit of lux, right? Do you agree with that? Yeah, so there is some lagging. Okay, let's go further and take a look, for example, on development experience. And if you're going to build something on top of gRPC in Java, we will see that gRPC is pretty good. And why we have to use gRPC? Because first of all, it's built on top of HTTP2, which means only one connection, which means performance, because HTTP right now allows you to, to send data in a binary format, which is good. Then it provides really good development experience because there is integration with protobuf, proper integration with protobuf. So all you have to do is just define a few proto files like this. So I g hope you, s you see that. Let me enter presentation mode, so it should be better. And what you have to do in order to create, for example, gRPC services, you have to define, for example, a few proto files which defines your uh, DTOs, whatever, and then you have to create a service definition, services definition. And then all you have to do is gRPC is to say, OK, this is my API. For example, this is my setup service, which allows me to request for some 
uh, current state of uh, on the map. For example, I can run rec plane request response and start playing the game, or I can get a stream from client by saying I expect the stream of locations, and I will return, for example, the stream of players if someone requests for for, for if someone tries to listen to other players. Actions. So this is really cool. So you have to define, you have to just define this API, and then you get all the rest of the syncs generated by gRPC plugin. So all, that's all uh, you have to have in your in your application. Everything will be generated, which is pretty good, and we don't have to do. We have to just focus on our business logic, like here. For example, like here. Come on, you still didn't scan it. Right, yeah, this is something went wrong. So you have to focus just on implementation of these interfaces, and that's all you have to do. This is pretty cool. You don't have to, to do anything else. And there is, first of all, integration with Spring, so you have to just bring one module, and you will get all the auto wiring of created services into the Spring. This, this is good. I like that. However, we have to ask, why not gRPC? If you're going to look at this picture, you will see the problem and the reason of this lacks. Do you see it? I will, see, I'll, I will show you. Do you see how location is streamed from client to server? In fact, if you're, if you're going to Google why gRPC is slow and why it's lagging, you will see the following picture. You will find the following schema. In fact, in order to run everything from, in order to integrate your browser or gRPC web with a server, you have to put Envoy Proxy in between. The reason for that is that from client side, nothing has changed. The client doesn't have direct access to HTTP2. It can't, the client can't say that I want to stream data in one particular connection. So there is no API in the browser. And what we all, we, what the only things we have to do is just emulate plain client request response and transform it into one connection over Envoy and emulate, for example, gRPC data sending. In order to listen to data stream, we have to open some chunking stream, few other connections, and in that way you listen to, to, to new updates. And this is a problem. In fact, gRPC web is not real gRPC, it's just a fake and wrapper around plain HTTP communication. And this is the problem and the reason of slow communication between uh, and reason of lagging and higher latency in, in our game. So, on the other hand, gRPC clearly states that they have back pressure, right? You, I guess everyone hears about back pressure. Have you ever heard about back pressure in gRPC? Right, so they clearly state that they have back pressure and proper flow control. And if you're going to look at their, their API, we will see that really important request method. So it means that, for example, subscriber can say, I want five messages, and gRPC should be able to provide only five messages. However, if you're going to look at the producer side or publisher side, we will see something like this. Do you see the, the place where we can see the number of requested elements? There is some way to control back pressure, and this is basically by checking the flag is ready. And now if you're going to, this is, this is caught again, do you see the problem? What could go wrong in case we have to check the isReady flag? What if this isReady flag is volatile Boolean, which can change at any mo point in time, at, at which could be some racing from different threads? So there is a higher chance that at some point we just read the flag, the flag says that you are, you are good to send some messages, but at the next moment, when you are going to the next line, this flux will turn to false, so you will, you will oversend one form more message to, to, uh, to your, for example, memory, right? So if you're going to Google and try to figure out whether this is a real problem, we will find this issue on GitHub, so this is a real issue on gRPC project. And one person, real person on uh, GitHub asked and observed the same problem, and this uh, person complaining that there is kind of kind of racing when the server checks its ready field and tries to send some elements. And the real maintainer, the current maintainer of gRPC Java answers, yeah, the, rest, the, the racing is totally possible. 
And unfortunately, gRPC has nothing to do with that. It's obviously that racing can appear. And the only guarantee, if we are going to check is ready, and this ready field returns false, is your application won't be, is there is no guarantee that your application observe that. Curtis, the end of the story about back pressure and gRPC. So, it's clear that if we're going to publish some messages, there is high chance that we overpublish a few elements. But what if there is a few more publisher in your application, in your one GVM, right? And this every publisher overproduce a few elements into your memory. What could happen? In order to figure out, let's just try to stress, to run stress test on our kind of pipeline, because this is the most important part in our system. So the scenario is the following. Of course, we are going to try to isolate our application and make our test as, as more reproducible as possible. That's why we are going to replace, for example, Kafka with some uh, more generic way to produce data with stable rate. So we are going to use Project Reactor because we know that Project Reactor is built on top of reactive streams. And when the client, when the subscriber requests for some data, our producer or publisher will produce exactly the number of data a subscriber requested. So this guy will be called only when there is a demand, demand from subscriber. Is it clear how it works? Great. So now what we are going to check. First of all, we will try to check the simplest case, when our publisher, when our subscriber is really fast. So we will check the case when subscriber is fast, and then we suddenly decrease the speed of, of our subscri subscriber and make our system really slow and check whether our middle server, through which we have a few producers, through which we have a few streams which are going and processing, whether this guy will, will survive or die. That's what we are going to check. Because this guy is res responsible for stability of the whole pipeline in, few, um, in, in, sim in simple words. So, in order to make it more real to what we are running in the cloud, because nowadays we are running everything in Kubernetes, in Dockers, so we provide only a few gigs of memory to our container, so we have to, pr to give the same environment and the same setup to, to our test, to our system, to our applications, right? So. Now let's try to run our test. Of course, um, if you're curious, I can share the videos of recording of the same test with, with, uh, with real application on the real environment. In, uh, in simplicity, if you're going to run this test, make our subscriber really fast, and then suddenly decrease the speed of our subscriber, we will see that there will be some back pressure, but our producer, producers will be producing lots of lots of messages for some short, short period of time. And then if you're going to look at, at the me measurement of throughput of our publisher and our subscriber, we will see, we will try to merge them, we will see that there is a point in time when our system started kind of being slow, slow. this is basically this point. And after that we will see that our producer produces a little bit more messages that our consumer consumes. So the, the, the lowest line is is consumer speed, so I, I'm, I'm going to show it again. So this is our consumer, this is our producer. And it's clear that producer overproduce more messages when the speed becomes slower for our subscriber. Do you see it? And the question where is, where are those messages? Where they are stored? And the answer is simple. There, in memory, in direct memory, which in a few moments will lead to that. To that. If you're going to run the same test, I will share the source, you'll be able to reproduce the same issue on your computer with the same setup. And this is a problem. Because, in fact, gRPC is a little bit fakey. As I said, it's just a wrapper on top of HTTP2. There is no application protocol. And there is back pressure, there is proper back pressure, but between just two elements in your whole pipeline. So, yeah, back pressure reacted but it reacted a little bit slower than it expected, it, and it was enough to overwhelm the middle part of your chain, of your stream. So, yeah, there is back pressure, but not that back pressure that we expected from, uh, from gRPC. And you can believe in what I'm saying, because I spent 
almost a month in order to make reactive gRPC as a wrapper on top of plain gRPC working stably. I spent a few nights and a few weeks of a normal working in order to make it just work with reactive streams. And it didn't help me to make this uh, sys solution more stable. Of course, you can tune it, play with window size, but this impact performance. And then the question, why do you need gRPC if performance will be really slow? This is the question. So to summarize what we have seen, we have seen that everything is pretty slow, either hard to implement, or there is some lack in the browser support. Every implementation has some particular flow control, but it's far from what we need. And the question then, do we want to work with those solutions? Do we want to solve all these challenges and then find another box in another box if we can spend our time more productively? Pr productively? Do we want to solve that? I don't think so. The, the same question were asked four years ago at Netflix, because they, they are really huge. They, their system is pretty amazing, amazingly big. Have you ever heard about Netflix? Yeah, I guess everyone heard about Netflix. And in Netflix, they have and they got almost the same case. In their cases, in, in their case, they got lots of clients connected to some gateway because this is security, so everything should be streamed through the gateway. And in general, what they're doing, they're streaming lots of information, video, messages, whatever updates over that gateway, over one stream, to absolutely different devices, to which they don't have any control and don't have any access, and they don't and they can't scale the load, for example, on your mobile phone or on PlayStation or your TV box. It's impossible because this is user devices. So the only option when these devices become unavailable or slow uh, in data consumption, they have to apply back pressure. So they try gRPC, and gRPC shows the same, the same results. This, the gateway crashed, like gRPC gateway crashed in a few minutes after startup, uh, with different stability of the, uh, of the devices on the left hand, and they figure it out the gRPC is unstable and that did, doesn't solve uh, the problem for, for, for them. So they started thinking, since Netflix is, uh, is a company which were doing RxJava for many years, which created lots of frameworks, so they decided to provide better solutions since they are doing reactive streams. They decided to provide proper application protocol with proper back pressure propagation as a network frame and provide their own application protocol, reactive application protocol, which got the name I will show later, our socket. You can learn the Netflix case studies on gRPC from one of the ex-developers. So if you're curious, you can listen to Ryland Degnan, who explains why gRPC didn't work for them. All right. So Netflix created our socket four years ago. And you may wonder what our socket is. From my point of view, our socket is a bright future. I love our socket. First of all, why I love it? Because our socket is a binary protocol. So it solved the problem of HTTP, which is text protocol. Our socket is binary. And what you have to do, you have, for example, take your Pacman, convert it to bin binary data to byte buffer, for example, send over the network. The most important part that our socket, as implementation, particular implementation, or in general as a protocol, take care of delivering all your payload in one frame. So you don't have to care about how to, to collect all the bytes afterwards. And then what you have to do, you have to just take all these bytes, all this byte buffer on the different side of the, of the connection and decode it back to your Pacman. Then it multiplexed. So what means multiplexed? I guess everyone heard about multiplexity in HTTP2. So you have one connection and you have a few virtual connection which works independently and doesn't have to preserve order, right? So our socket provides the same future. You can create lots of logical streams and send them over one connection, multiplex them over one connection without care about ordering. That's the problem of protocol itself and it will solve it. And it solved that in providing some additional IDs of every virtual stream. So in fact, it provides some logical stream under the hood. And what you have to do, you have to just use, for example, Project Reactor or RxJava, and that's it. That's the whole API you have to use, for example, in our socket Java. Then the most coolest thing. You don't have to rely, for example, on HTTP2 HTTP like gRPC. You can use whatever you want. For example, you can use TCP. 
in order to provide the same streaming with the same behaviors. You can use WebSocket if you want to wire communication between client and server, the same API without any changes. You can use the same HTTP2 with all the HTTP2 built-in features. Or you can use, for example, Quick when it become a, becomes available, or Iron if you want to use advanced UDP uh, protocol built on top of uh, protocol built on top of UDP. So this is cool. There is no particular um, tight coupling with particular transport, and this is just protocol which works on top of anything. This is cool. It's bidirectional. So what it means? Basically, there is a client and server when you create a connection, so you connect to some specific port. Afterwards, both the client and the server can implement even handler or connect or request handler and then request boss into boss direction for some data streams or plain request response. What else? As I say, this is implementation of reactive streams protocol, like reactive streams as a pro application protocol. So if you know, reactive streams provide back pressure over requesting data and sending the, the number of messages. And now if you want to, for example, request for some more messages for other service, you, for example, call a method this method call will be converted to byte, to byte, to byte frame. You'll be sent over the network, converted back, and then the responder implementation will invoke the same request method on the publisher, so the publisher, publisher will be able to produce exactly requested number of messages. This is cool, real propagation of back pressure. And what's the most important? Our socket is not only about streaming. There is a few interaction models, so you can implement whatever you want. You can do the same request response, so you can request for data and get response. You can use some advanced request response, which is just sending a message and forget about the result. So I, I care about delivering the message, but I don't care how long it will be processed. There is request stream, so you can send, I want to listen for a stream of messages, like in case of updates from other players' location. Or you can send stream of information from your client, to your server. So this is kind of bi-directional streaming also building into the protocol. In general, there is a few more notable features, like there is losing in case you want to, for example, on the server side, control the number of requests from your client because client can do request response, can do request stream, and you know that I can handle only a few logical streams. So you can send, say, to every connection created to your, to your server how many calls it's allowed to, to make by this connection. You know your capacity, so you say, okay, this guy is allowed to do only five requests per second, or any kind of request, but this is my capacity for, for this connection. If you got more connection, you can calc recalculate your, uh, your capacity and share less uh, request number for every connection. So you can control basically the stability of the server not only about, uh, about the client, but the server as well. And in this way, provide more resilient, uh, better guarantee for your resilience, for your system resilience. In turn, there is resumability. Just imagine that your client is, for example, Android phones or iOS phones. So when you are walking, you are switching from one Wi-Fi to another, from 3G to 4G, which means that you were connected to a stream of data over WebSocket, but then you suddenly switch it your uh, connection source or network source. It doesn't guarantee that you will get the same, you will be reconnected to the same socket, so the, the bytes will be continued to send. And this is a problem because you were listening to a stream of data and then were, it were interrupted. So you have either to restream everything, or in case there is resumability, like in our socket, you can say, there were my session, please, continue this stream from this particular point. And then you will get everything that will be uh, observed after your disconnection. Does it make sense? Like you can continue the streaming of your logical streams. And this is cool, this is built-in feature. Or if you wanna send, for example, big, big PDFs files which waits for one, hundreds of megabytes, you can split them into smaller chunks and, to, and send one by one without blocking any other logical streams. And this is cool. This is built-in feature as well. So in general, if you're going to look at the whole RSocket ecosystem, we will see the support in many languages, Java, JavaScript, C++, Go, .NET. You can use whatever architecture you want. For example, RPC or messaging, any message format, you can convert everything to bytes. And what's the most important, you can use it on top of any kind of transport. That's cool. 
So let's take a look at, the, at our socket and let's try to assess it. Please connect to, to our socket implementation and let's figure out whether it's better or not. The same link, only different is our socket. So, let's open the browser. This is our socket version of the game. And let's connect. And here we go. It works amazing. There is no lags. I was, or I was caught. I were wasted my life. Let me try again, another try. But you can agree. The gameplay is, is really smooth, right? Do you see it? The gameplay is really smooth. There is no lags. Oh, I am attackable. That's not good. And the gameplay is really cool. There is no lags. I like it. So it's clear that game experience is much better. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's cool. What about development experience? So if you're going to look at our socket Java, what we have to do in order to create, for example, our socket server, we have to use our socket factory, say that we want to receive some connections. We want to define handler over saying that this is a scepter. We have to define transport. The, the way to define transport is really easy. There is few, there is few built-in implementations of WebSocket, TCP, Iron, Transport, so you can choose whatever you want and define just a port. Then you have to start your application server and wait for connection and block the main thread in order to make your Java application running. That's all you have to do. To respond, for example, if you want to implement a socket acceptor, what you have to do, you have to provide abstract version of our socket. You have to say, for example, I want to handle request stream. You receive payload, and you will respond with Flux, which is amazing, integration with reactive streams. Then in order to send some messages, you have to deal with payloads. And what's the most important, that there is a version of byte buff payload that doesn't require you to copy anything into your memory. So you can either provide a stream or some bytes or arrays of, array of bytes in order to send it, uh, them from one client to other server. Easy. Plain implementation for, for, for payload. Then the whole Java implementation can look like that. Really simple, right? And what's the most important, the, the implementation on the GS side is not that much complex than on the Java side. You have to just define a few more setups. You have to say if there is a few options to defy, keep alive, which, is, which, which means that it's important to notify your, your server that I am alive. If you're a client, so there is an option to set up. You can choose particular MIPE type for your messages, for your headers. And then you have to just say, OK, WebSocket client connection, and here is my responder if server decides to call me for some data. Easy. Now, in this way, you can use, for example, different ways to, to, to create some stream of, or channel in order to send flux and receive flux, request stream, etc. So all kind of APIs which integrates with reactive streams. And if you're a user of RPC, because you remember, we implemented one of the, our solution on top of gRPC, and you are using today gRPC, the good news is our socket has integration with RPC or, and Protobuf as well. So what you have to do is, to, is just to bring one dependency into your project, change a few lines in your Protobuf configuration if you use, for example, Gradle or, Grade or, or Maven. So that's all you have to do in order to bring code generation. And then you will get all these classes and clients and server and interface generated for you. Amazing. Almost nothing to, to re-implement and to do by own if you're using gRPC. If you don't like gRPC and you want to use, for example, Spring Framework, if you are a fan of Spring MVC or Spring WebFlux, there is integration with, yeah, this is example of RPC service. There is integration with Spring Messaging. If you want to use RSocket in Spring, that's all you have to bring into your project. One starter, and that's it. Then you have to define a few configurations, and then you will get this amazing controller. Just a few annotations, like Spring Controller, Message Mapping, Message Mapping again in order to define the path. And here we go. We can handle requests from other Spring clients or servers and work in with Spring Framework uh, in the same way as before. Right? This, this is cool future. This is basically what I really love in RSocket, that it became, becomes really adopted by many frameworks. 
All right. What about stress test? This is important to understand. What if you're going to run this, the same stress test? Now, since our socket propagates real back pressure by sending real frames with request M, in order to start, we have to, of course, we have to check whether our, how our system will work with fast producer. For example, fast producer will request for 10 messages. This will be shared between all clients. It depends on your logic, of course. And then after you requested some messages, clients start sending. And then you will be able to asynchronously request request and request new messages. But in case your, service, your subscriber becomes slower, everything will be stable because now server will be requesting for less amount of data. And of course, producers will be produce less amount of data. And this is a built-in feature. If you're processing data slower, then the number of requests will appear with uh, less frequency or less frequent. What if the client is uh, misbehaved? Because there is a protocol, I suppose. Yeah, uh, we will talk about that later. So let me finalize it. And in general, if you collect some information, we will see that throughput of producer and consumer are identical. That's cool. So in general, to summarize, Simplicity in development pretty good. The, perf the framework is high performance because only one connection plus uh, binary data sending. Efficient resource usage, high flexibility because there is a few m methods to, to communicate between each other, and better reliability. This is amazing. What about disadvantages? There is a few disadvantages, of course. There is still under development, and the protocol is still in the version 0.0.1 as application protocol as specification. And for client or uh, server or particular implementation, for example, in Java, it's 0 0.12.4. Uh, so it's still under development, which is not good. And there is no good adoption so far. However, under the protocol stays, behind the protocol states those big companies, which are using our socket today. And you basically, if you're using Facebook Messenger, Messenger you're using our socket with GraphQL in combination. That's cool. So in general, to summarize all protocols, we can see the following picture. All protocols has its own benefits. For example, Socket.io works pretty good in JS world. gRPC, in some cases and circumstances, could be really fast and high performant. However, reactive and reactive system is about stability. So in order to provide stable and reliable system, you have to use our socket because it provides real reactive streams with back pressure support. So few more resources. If you want to learn more about our socket, follow me and my company on Twitter. We are the main, main supporter of our socket. There is community. You can ask any question. There is video channel, you can learn more about our socket, and there is our socket in Spring, so you can start using Spring uh, with our socket today. And if you want to achieve some cloud native enterprise version of our socket with load balancing, predictive data streaming, there is a version of our socket with socket, our socket broker by the following link. That's all from my side. If you got any questions, I am available backstage, and thank you for your atten attention. Question, yeah. What if, the, um, what if the client does not... Uh, In case client doesn't follow the R socket protocol, you will get a uh, connection rejected uh, exception, and you won't be connected to R socket server, for example. Any other questions? If you have... I am here. If you are interested, yeah, please. So basic uh, rely, uh, kind of warranties for message delivering is in with regards of transport that you are using. For example, if you are using TCP, TCP will uh, do that acknowledgement yourself. But if you want to provide some logical level acknowledgement, you have to use and implement some logic uh, by yourself. So for example, request response, you have to send a request and then to wait for response. Or if you don't care about deliverability and whether the elements were processed or not, you can use fire and forget, and that's it. Other questions? Okay, so thank you for your attention again, and have a nice evening and the rest of the conference.